Good morning. Uh, once again, it's my opportunity to say welcome to our Sunday School session here at St. Red's Baptist Church. Uh, today we will be uh, teaching from the second quarter 2022 based on the International Lesson Series. And we will be looking at Unit 3, The Great Hope of the Saints, Lesson Number 10. Of course, this is August 7, 2022. Uh, the title of the lesson today is A New Home with a devotional reading taken from Isaiah, the 32nd chapter, verses 9 through 20, with the background scripture coming from Revelation, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 9. And the printed passage for this lesson, the verses that we will be discussing, is Revelation 21, uh, verses 1 through 9. And our key verse, a golden text, is Revelations 21 and 4 from the New, New International or NIV version. And it reads, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Now as we get ready to go into our lesson, I'm going to begin this with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity to present this lesson. We thank you for all the things that you have done for us, how you have watched over us, kept us from all hurt, harm, and danger, and allowing us to see this, this brand new day, Father. We realize it's not because we've been so good, but because your grace and mercy has kept us through the time, through the turmoil, and all the things that we are experiencing here in this country and in this world. We ask you to keep us in your care, keep your loving arms around us. Bless those that are assembled to hear this lesson with such blessings that you see that they stand in need of. And Father, we just thank you, we love you, and we can't do without you. We ask you to continue to lead us and guide us. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name, amen. As we were saying, uh, we will be talking about Revelations, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 9. And a common theme of that is a new heaven and a new earth. Just to give a context on the 21st chapter of Revelations, uh, we'll give you a little history uh, on how this lesson is put together and where it falls because we're right in the middle of the book of Revelation. Uh, the word revelations mean an unveiling or, dis or disclosure. Uh, this writing unveils future events such as the rapture, the three series of judgment that will fall on earth during the tribulation, the emergence of the Antichrist, the persecution of Israel, and her amazing revival, as well as Jesus' second coming with his saints to the earth, the judgment of Satan and his followers, and finally the eternal state. This content combined with the original Greek term apocalypse is why we refer to the end of the world scenario as an apocalypse. Now leading up to this chapter, all sin and evil have been entirely defeated. Satan is banished to hell along with every person who rejected Christ as seen in chapter 20. Here John describes the nature of the New Jerusalem the heavenly city which descends onto the earth after the ultimate victory over evil. And then once you get to chapter 22, it's a further description of this perfect eternity and the last messages from Jesus to those who read John's word. From the time described midway through Genesis chapter 3 until the events of Revelation chapter 20, the earth is experienced uh, is experiencing the presence of sin and death. At the end of chapter 20, John sees God delivering the final ultimate judgment on Satan, casting all evil into the lake of fire. And then at that point, creation will finally be free from everything wicked. And what follows is a description of a remade, a restored earth. Now, following the great white throne judgment of chapter 20, John sees a new heaven and a new earth. And, and sometimes scholars debate whether this means that all of the creation will be destroyed and remade or that God will recondition creation. The terminology used seems to suggest a, a renewal. John sees the new city of Jerusalem sending onto the earth and voices celebrating the restored relationship between God and man. In particular, John hears the voice from the throne declare an end to suffering, 
pain and death for all eternity. And at the same time, John hears a reminder that sin and those who chose it over God are condemned to the second death or hell. You'll find that in Revelation verses 21, 1 through 8. Now, as we move into our lesson today, we start out looking at verses 1 through 4, and we break that down. Revelation 21 and 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Revelations 21 and 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her, her, her husband. Now, we talk about a new heaven and a new earth. The ideal of a new earth with an atmosphere and sky is a familiar theme in the scripture. Many of the prophets, both Old and New Testament, spoke of this new heaven and new earth. And it's worth remembering the new heaven referred to doesn't mean the heaven where God is enthroned. The Bible uses the word heaven in three senses. The first heaven is the earth's atmosphere. That's the blue sky we see. The second heaven is out of space of that dark night sky we see. And the third heaven is the place where God lives in glory. When scriptures speak of the new heaven, they mean a new blue sky, a new night sky, not a new heaven where God dwells. <clears throat> new heaven and new earth. The ancient Greek word translated here is Cain, K-A-I-N-E. And that means new in character or fresh. It doesn't mean recent or new in time. And this just isn't the next heaven or the next earth. This is a better heaven and a better earth replacing the old, the first earth that has passed away. The destruction of heaven and earth by fire and the day of judgment, which are described in previous chapter will be followed by the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. In this case, heaven is a reference to the atmosphere above the earth, not the heaven of God's throne. The heaven of God's throne will never pass away and will never need to be recreated. As the earth and its atmosphere were changed by water during the time of Noah, the earth and the atmosphere will be renovated by fire before it's eternal state. The creation of the new heaven and earth will begin a new order when God himself will dwell with his people in the new Jerusalem. There will be no sea. This aptly represents freedom from conflict and passions, temptations, trouble, changes, and alarm from whatever can divide, interrupt the communications of the saint. The new heaven and new earth will not be separate from each other. The earth of the saints, their glorified bodies will be heavenly. The old world with all its troubles, turmoils, will have passed away. The Greek word used for pass away can also be used for changing from one condition to another. The earth and all its creation were completely renovated by fire. Now, in these verses, the New Jerusalem is described as the holy city, beautifully dressed as a bride for her husband. The New Jerusalem will contrast with the fallen Jerusalem, which will commit sin and adultery against God as the great prostitute. Now, the New Jer Jerusalem is described as a bride prepared, adorned for her husband. John uses the most striking, beautiful image he could think of. The most beautiful thing a man will ever see is his bride coming down the aisle ready to meet him. John said that this is how beautiful the New Jerusalem would be. This is a Jerusalem uh, that's described in, throughout the Bible in different ways. In Hebrews 12 and 22, Two, it's described as the Jerusalem of hope. In Galatians 4 and 26, it's uh, described as the Jerusalem above. And in Philippians 3 and 20, it's described as the place of our real citizenship. The term holy and new distinguishes the city because it is holy and new. It is different from any earthly city. The name Jerusalem gives it continuity with the earth, especially the place of our redemption. It is significant that this glorious dwelling place of God and his people is described as a holy city. Cities are places where many people 
are, are interacting with each other. This isn't an isolation, but a perfect community of the people of God. The Christian concept of a heavenly city, as a city, heaven as a city, a place of life, activity, interest, and people, and it's very different if you think about other religions. The Hindu concept of a blank nirvana is just a place. But the consummation of the Christian hope is supremely social. It is no flight of the alone to the alone, but life in the redeemed community of heaven. Man has never known a community unmarred by sin. Adam and Eve only knew it for a limited time. Uh, now the community at large came long after the fall though. Here in the New Jerusalem, we have something totally unique a sinless, pure community of righteousness. We have what we call a holy city. But the problem arises when believers expect this kind of community now. You know, we want peace on earth and goodwill to men. So sometimes we fail to realize that this only comes down out of heaven. This city is not and can never be achieved a man. It's only a gift from God. So as we look at Revelation 21 and 3, it reads, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. 21 and 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Now, we talk about the tabernacle of men is with God. That's why he's dwelling with him now. If you think about Moses' tabernacle, it represented the dwelling place of God on earth. That was the past representation of the dwelling place of God. But this tabernacle is God, is the reality of his presence with his people. He would dwell with them and they shall be his people. This essentially states the essence of God's desire and man's purpose. Simply, God's desire is to live in close fellowship with man, and man's purpose is to be a people unto God. This is the great glory of heaven and the ultimate restoration of what was lost when Adam fell. Now, if uh, that was a writing from the theologian Spurgeon, and he wrote it in plain terms, and I quote, I do not think the glory of Eden lay in grassy walks or boughs bending with luscious fruit, but its glory lay in that the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the day. Here was Adam's highest privilege, that he had companionship with the Most High God. And John is saying that we will have that same opportunity. And then he tells us the former things have passed away. The New Jerusalem is distinguished by what it does not have. There will be no tears, no sorrow, no death, or pain. Later it will be shown that the New Jerusalem has no temple, no sacrifice, no sun, no moon, no darkness, no sin, and no abomination. Now, man comes into the world with a cry. When we get here, we are crying, and we go out with a groan, and anything in between is in tone with helpless wailing. We're constantly calling a need in others. But the hallelujahs of the renewed world will drown out the voices of woe forever. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, as John said, every tear, for there may be many tears of bereaved affliction, such as Mary and Martha, the widow of Nain wept, tears of sympathy and mercy, such as Jeremiah and Jesus wept over the sins and calamities of Jerusalem, tears of persecution of the innocent, tears of contrition and penance for faults or crimes against the goodness and majesty of heaven, tears of disappointment and neglect, tears of yearning for what can now cannot be ours. These and whatever others ever cause that tears run down the cheek, they shall be dried up forever once we get to heaven. Now, as we look at Revelations 21 and 5, it reads, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He that sat on the throne said, this is an authoritative announcement coming from the throne of God itself. 
This is one of the few times in Revelation where we clearly see God speaking directly from his throne. Then he said, behold, I will make all things new. This statement is in the presence tense. I am making everything new. This is the consummation of God's work of renewal and redemption, having begun here and now in our present time. Paul saw this same transformation at work on this side of eternity when he wrote in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and in Corinthians 5 and 17. He wrote, therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become brand new. All things new. This is a brief, brief glance at the thinking behind God's eternal plan to allow sin and its destruction in order to do a greater work of making all things new. At this point in his plan of the ages, the plan is complete. All things are new. Now, our instinct is to romantically consider the innocence as man's perfect state and wish that Adam would never have done what he did. But we fail to realize that redeemed man is greater than innocent man, that we gain more in Jesus than we lost in Adam. God's perfect state is one of redemption, not innocent. When God finally completes this work of making all things new, they will stay new. Presumably this means not only that everything will be made new, but also everything will stay new. The entropy law will be repealed. Nothing will wear out or decay, or no one will age uh, atrophy anymore. Then if we look at Revelation 21, 6 through 8, we talk about the invitation and a warning. Revelation 21 and 6. He said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. The person that sits upon the throne that makes all things new is Jesus. He is the creator. He did not make a mistake with his original creation. He will regenerate creation back to the way he created it with the addition of the adornment of the holy city and the bride who occupies it. Now from prior passages in the book, we see that Jesus uses the title Alpha and Omega for himself. Jesus makes it clear that the water of life he gives is free. It's a free gift for anyone who is thirsty for it. And then he makes the statement, it is done. What is he saying? God's eternal purpose in Jesus is now accomplished. Ephesians 1 and 10 has been fulfilled. And that reads that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. At this point, all things have been resolved, summed up in Jesus. It is done. Now, he said, I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirst. Drinking and thirst are common pictures of God's supply and man's spiritual need. Drinking is an action, but it is an action of receiving. Like faith, it is doing something, but it is not a merit-earning work within itself. What does a thirsty man do to get rid of his thirst? He drinks. Perhaps there is no better representation of faith in all the word of God than that. To drink is to receive, to take in the refreshing drought, and that is all. A man's face may be unwashed, but yet he can drink. He may be very unworthy character, but yet a drought of water will remove his thirst. Drinking is such a remarkable, easy thing, it is even more simple than eating. We have to chew to eat, but we just have to swallow to drink. As we look at Revelation 21 and 7, those who are victorious inherit all this. I will be their God and they shall be my children, 21 and 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, 
the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, he said, he who overcomes will inherit all things. Those who overcome by faith in Jesus, and this as stated in John, 1 John 5 and 5, enjoy a special relationship. I will be his God and he shall be my son, as stated there. But the cowardly, unbelieving, the abominable have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. It's saying those who reject Jesus and make themselves apostate, which means they get rid of their religious belief, are specifically prohibited from entering the New Jerusalem. And then it mentioned the word cowardly. Now, you may ask yourself, is cowardice enough to send a person to hell? Well, John is not speaking of the natural timidity, but of that cowardice, which is the last result uh, when a person chooses self and safety before Christ. That was a writer, John Trapp, that wrote of the cowardly recants, white-livered milksop that put their horns for every pile of grass that touches them. They are afraid of every new step. He's just basically saying, Christ is looking for bold Christians in this day. We can't be afraid of everything. You know, everyone is declaring their rights and coming out of the closet, but sometimes we as Christians want to hide our faith when we should be standing up and making others sit down. Now, the scriptures make it clear that we overcome by being washed in the blood of the Lamb. All who accept the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for the forgiveness of their sin and drink the living water that comes from Jesus will become, will become sons of God and inherit all things of God. If one inherit all things, it would exclude nothing given. In other words, those who not come to Jesus, who do not come to Jesus for forgiveness, will retain their sins. As a result, they will have their part in the lake of fire, being cast in the lake of fire it's the second death. The first death is the death of the body and flesh. And I wondered why, you know, I had read somewhere where it say, uh, the fearful will get this fate with the rest of these characters until I understood that it is talking about those that fear the death of the body more than the death of the soul, like those that receive the mark of the beast and to save their physical lives in the book of Revelation. Now our final verse in this lesson is Revelation 21 and 9 that reads, one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. In this final verse of this lesson, John is carried away by the same angel to see the holy city, Jerusalem, who is the bride and wife of the Lamb. The new Jerusalem that will come down from heaven will not contain a temple as the Lord himself will serve as the temple. Neither will there be any wicked, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. This heavenly city is literal, but it is called the bride of the lamb's wife because it is the place where all God's people are gathered. In this sense, the new Jerusalem is certainly like the bride, but this association doesn't diminish the reality behind the image. The city is associated with the bride to all us with the sense of its beauty. And that concludes our lesson. As usual, I have three practical applications that I will leave you with from today's lesson. The first application is our instinct to so romantically consider innocence of man perfect state and wish Adam would have never done what he did, but we fail to realize that redeemed man is greater than innocent man, that we gain more in Jesus than we ever lost in Adam. God's perfect state is one of redemption, not innocence. Uh, application number two, when God finally completes this work of making all things new, they will stay new. Presumably this means not only everything will be made new, but everything will stay new. The entropy law will be repealed, nothing will wear out or decay, 
and no longer will age or atrophy anymore. And application number three, uh, the idea of tears in heaven should never be used as a tool to, of guilt or manipulation on this earth. There is just no grounds for imagining from this text that the saints will shed tears in heaven concerning the failures of their former life on earth. The emphasis here is on the comfort of God, not on the remorse of the saints. And that concludes, concludes our lesson. Uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you once again for the opportunity to serve. We thank you for those who have listened. We thank you for those of our church who are subscribing. We ask that something that we say or do may enlighten someone and draw them to see you and not us. These are other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.